The first documented diagnosis of a psychopath is complicated. It's a personality trait as old as humanity. Those people who live their lives with a lack of empathy, guilt, or remorse. Maybe that personality trait manifests itself in someone who's a pathological liar. Maybe they are way over the top with their sense of self-worth. Maybe they're a sexual deviant. Maybe they can kill someone, go to work, and then go home to their wife and kids like there's nothing wrong. Look at the case of Dennis Rader, the BTK killer. Over two decades in Wichita, Kansas, he killed at least 10 people. He was also married for 34 years with two children and was a Boy Scout leader and president of his church congregation. Looking back at the origins of the term, many researchers agree the first clinical case of a psychopath can be traced to ancient Greek philosophy. We're talking 384 years before Christ, BC. A student of the scientist and philosopher Aristotle named Theophrastus. From a study in 2013 authored by Oxford University lecturer Nicholas Theodorakis, Quote, one of Aristotle's students describes the characteristics of psychopathy in the same way that they are defined in the present day, the illness of the mind, the sense of being irresponsible and morally weak. The examples throughout time are numerous. Historical figures like King Leopold II, American serial killers like Ted Bundy, fictional characters like Hannibal Lecter. According to a study by University of New Mexico nanoscientist Professor Kent Beale, and Colorado District Court Judge Morris Hoffman, at any given time in the United States, the best current estimate is that just less than 1% of all non-institutionalized males age 18 or over are psychopaths. That's about 1.1 million people. More than 1 million psychopaths walking around free in the United States, with another 6.7 million in prison, jail, or parole. They're not all killers, of course, but these people do take up an astonishingly disproportionate amount of criminal justice resources. All this to bring us to the Upper West Side of Manhattan in 1990, a perfectly constructed wooden box at the corner of 66th Street and West End Avenue. It sat there for a few days, no one knew what to do about it, until they opened it. Inside, the decomposing body of a young woman. Turns out the psychopath who did this to her is someone she knew very well. I'm Dan Bowens, and this is The Tape Room. We're part of the Fox 5 Podcast Network. In this series, we take a look back at some of the tri-state area's infamous and unsolved crimes. We think it's important to shed new light on these cases. This time, the woman in a box, the Brushingham murder. A crime in New York City from 1990 that has stuck with retired NYPD homicide detective Thomas Highland, who is also now a professor at John Jay College. This is our conversation about that unforgettable case. Thomas Highland, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, everyone calls you Tommy, right? All my friends do, yeah. yeah. With NYPD, with the Homicide Squad back in the late 80s, early 90s, I mean, we're talking about a time when there were hundreds, if not thousands, of murders that were taking place in the city back yeah. then. Yeah, yes there was, yeah. Talk to me about that. Talk to me about that, 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 what was happening, I mean, from a police perspective, when you would look out there and you would see, oh my God, there's one or two, I mean, you're talking about more than one murder a day. Oh, there's a, more, well, obviously more than one murder a day. I mean, it was, as I mentioned once before, it was 2,245 murders in, in like 1992, I think it was, in 1991. 2,200 murders. Yeah, in the five boroughs. You know, there's more people killed in New York in one year than, than until recently in Afghanistan in six, 17 years of war. So, you know, you, you're dealing with, you know, you're dealing with the five boroughs. You're dealing with, you know, there's four murders a night sometimes, three murders a night, you know. And, and the Homicide Squad didn't actually take the case. The case stayed with the, with the um, precinct detective. But the, what we did, we were, we were more of the uh, backfill for them. Uh, many, many times we would actually take the case, work it, and see if we could solve it within, until the next one came along, which could have been 20 minutes from then. But, uh, you know, and, and try to do the best we can before giving it back. Or, you know, get enough for an, uh, for an arrest and then have the precinct detective make the arrest. You know, so. And a lot yes, of them were, at that point, were drug-related. I mean, these are, these are hard yeah. cases to solve because you maybe know the motive, know the 
reason mm -hmm. and it's just a, one of the, a business transaction or whatever it might be. I mean, these are yeah. it, those are those are pretty hard cases to solve, even though very, they're relatively simple. Very, very, yeah. It, it, it um, and then the crack epidemic came through in the late '80s, um, which which is kind of a kind of an interesting drug. Because you know whether uh, um, un unlike the heroin epidemic, which is a, a central nervous system depressant, which brings the person kind of down and you know nodding out in the street, falling asleep, the crack is a, uh, uh, a central nervous system uh, amphetamine, and that brings them up, and it's so addictive that the 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 um, the purchaser started killing the distributor to get the crack. So uh, it, it wasn't a depressed kind of a drug. It was a, it in was almost a, a rage. Kind oh of yeah, a well yeah, in in in, in, a, in in a habit form, you know, that they needed the drug that bad, and uh, it was also um, a, a psychological effect of crack that many many uh, addicts, crack addicts, could witness something, be there when something happened. Not necessarily witness it, because I don't think that their you know their their uh, cognitive ability was distorted also. So they could sit there and watch a homicide, and then when you bring them in five, 10, 20 minutes later, or half an hour later, an hour later, give you no details about what happened. I have no idea what happened. And it's so an amazing you're, drug. You're yeah. dealing with all these cases. Mm -hmm. 1990 comes around right in the thick of these things. A box <laughs> yeah. on yeah. the Upper West Side. Yeah. That, yeah. that, 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 what was in that box is something that, uh, that yeah. probably was, sticks with you yeah, all these does. years later. Yeah, it was, it was, it's such an interesting case because, you know, we, 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 Manhattan always has sensational homicides, you know, so if something happens in Manhattan, you know, many, many times, as opposed to something happening in Brooklyn North or in the South Bronx, we're going to get notoriety, we're going to get a lot of press on it, that sort of stuff. And when you find a dead, um, you know, Caucasian female, you know, in a perfectly made box of three-quarter inch plywood that was left out for the, for the garbage. And then it was too big for the garbage men to take it and brought back and then left out again and too big again and brought back. And then finally the aroma from the decomposition of the victim. And when you open the box, you find this, um, um, this we can't say shapely because she was in decomposition, but you find this female wearing um, 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 a, a, a sweater, and she was wearing Gloria Vanderbilt underwear. She was, she was wearing her, under, her undergarments uh, uh, were uh, Lily of France. So she's wearing clothes that... Designer stuff. D designer stuff, yeah. And she, she was wrapped in, in good, goodwill uh, drapes inside the, 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 the box. And her her um, her features were distorted because she was left face down in the box. She'd been in the box about five six days. And when we talk about this box. We're not talking about a cardboard box. I mean, we're talking no, about no. This this was yeah. It was, this was a three quarter inch plywood perfect cube. So it was it was perfectly. You could run your hand across it. There was no bumps or anything. It was just perfect. You go right to the end, and either way you want to go. Okay. The screws were were uh, I forget what the term is the, the carpentry term, but the screws were were pushed in. I mean, you, could, you wouldn't even touch a screw if you went over. It was a perfectly made box. And that's why it sort of stood out and, and really looked odd in this area that we're talking about. I mean, where, where on the uh, west side of Manhattan? It was 66th Street and West End Avenue. That's it was over at Lincoln Towers. You know, right? that's, that's pretty close to even where they have um, the Lincoln Center now. And, yeah, and right. And yeah. pretty close to where the Juilliard School yeah. is that we're talking and about. And it was a, kind of a middle class Manhattan. neighborhood, too. So, you know, we find this, this woman dressed and as a middle class person would dress probably or an upper middle class person and so naturally we we're, we're, we're pinpointing that area and as it turned out that she was from you know like 72nd or 79th street over on central park west over that way so the body was moved put in the box the box was made she was put in the box wrapped in the drapes and then the box got from point a to point b and at that point, you don't know where we she, had no idea who she was you don't know who she was so as a detective no you're coming and you're saying oh my god yeah, we're looking at this yeah. woman in a box on the Upper West Side with pretty designer clothes. What happens then? The first step is to figure out who she is. Well, right? they, they, she, yeah, she goes to the morgue, and of course they fingerprint her, and nothing came back on the fingerprints. There was no record whatsoever. Um, you know, it was pre-DNA, really. Um, the DNA was out there, but it was just in its infancy. 
So, so we don't have that way to go. We don't have fingerprints way to go to identify who she is. So we spent a couple of days canvassing. You know, Lincoln Towers is a lot of buildings mm -hmm. there, you know, big high buildings. So we're canvassing and who's seen the box. And, and we find people from very rich people who saw the box to, to homeless people who saw the box, to very poor people who saw the box. And, but nobody you know, who saw who brought the box. Nobody saw who brought the box. Nobody knew how the box got there. It was just this huge cube that contained a, you know, a female uh, inside of it, and wrapped, finally, wrapped in the drapes. You guys eventually, at this point, okay, we can't figure out who she is. Maybe reluctantly at the time, you have to go to the media and say, hey, yeah. we, we put the word out. And, and how, how quickly after you put the word out, did you start to see, okay, it, was it, it looks like uh, mm -hmm. Marsha, Marsha Brushingham. Brushingham, Marsha, she was an actress, yeah. Um, yeah it didn't the, take long before you figured no, out No, well, we had this dead body for, you know, a uh, uh, homicide victim. We knew the cause of death. It was blunt force trauma. Um, her head was opened up, fractured skull, and, you know, she was beat down pretty, pretty well. And so we, but we don't know who she is. So, you know, you have to, to start, you have to have a place to start. You start with the body, yeah, but who is the body? So, you know, we hemmed and hawed about this for a long time. We, de detectives never want to go to mainstream media mm -hmm. at all. We don't want nothing to do with them. I won't you know? take offense to it. Don't, please don't. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we're both doing the same thing in a lot of ways. You know, ma mainstream media journalism, you know, real journalism, is trying to find out the same things we're trying to find out. They're trying to get to the bottom of the story. And so are we. So we never really go to them. Uh, many, many times they get in the way and this and the other thing. But we did have, we, we had somebody who we knew, um, I knew, and, and the captain there knew, uh, socially, you know, a, a reporter, John Miller, who's now the uh, uh, deputy commissioner for uh, counterterrorism in the New York City Police Department. And I think John was working for maybe Channel 4 at the time. Mm -hmm. um, so we went to John, and what we did was, you know, we asked him, listen, can you give us a hand on, you know, um, on the six o'clock news, and what we did was we took what she was wearing. She, she was wearing a reindeer sweater, okay, and the Gloria Vanderbilt pants, and, and uh, I, I, I don't remember if we laid out the underwear. I'm not sure about that, but we laid it out, and, and John came in, and they brought a, a crew up with him, um, cameramen, and they took pictures of, of the clothes that she was wearing, okay? Well, we couldn't give him a, a photo of the body. It was just, you know, it was just decomposed. So, uh, if I'm not mistaken, within you know eight o'clock that night, we had a phone call, and uh, it came from a, a man who who lived um, uh, down the village, and um, he was he was an art collector, and um, I, I think he he was uh, involved in in the uh, dramatics entertainment, mm -hmm. the, you the know, theater, right? theater, and um, he said I have a friend of mine that has a sweater like that, and I think her corduroy. Um, uh, Gloria Vanderbilt jeans are similar also. So we went down to see him. And uh, he was a difficult guy at first. Um, I remember he had a, 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 a Benton painting, Thomas Benton. And um, believe me, I'm not, you know, I'm, not, I'm not an artistic kind of guy. But I like Benton myself. You know, sure. I, you know, I took it in college. And uh, so I mentioned it to him. We were talking, and he was pretty hesitant. You know, he wasn't necessarily that fond of uh, police. And so I, I asked him, I said, is that a Benton? And he said, uh, I said, you know, is that a replica of a Benton? And he goes, no, it is a Benton. You know, so I said, oh, okay, fine. Uh, so we started talking about Benton, and then that kind of eased the thing over, and then he talked about uh, this friend of his, Marsha, that he knew. She was an actress, uh, mostly off-Broadway stuff, and uh, he hasn't talked to her. He's called her, hasn't talked to her in a while. And we brought him up to the precinct and debriefed him a little bit and uh, went to the house where she lived. And, you know, that's when the whole thing kind of exploded for us, you know. Now you have a name. Now, now we knew who she a, was, now and now we have a family, and now we have a location where she lives, and her mother lived in the same building, and, you know, now, now we're, up, we're up working on 79th Street, or 72nd Street, uh, as opposed to 66th Street, which is pretty distance away when you think about it, and then, you know, the canvas then produces the superintendent who says, yeah, I helped him with this box, and, you know, he had a little hand railing, a hand cart. And by and him? The brother, her brother, so, yeah. So before then, you go to the apartment. Is that where the crime looked like it had happened, inside the apartment? Yeah, not in her apartment, but it happened in, in, the, in the mother's apartment upstairs. And uh, 
the background of the whole thing was that the motive was that he he had been he was always a strange kind of guy in his family, and um, you know he had stepchildren and, and he was a stepbrother to a few people and the victim, and um, what he did was he he was cut out of the will of a very rich aunt in Florida, and he 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 presented himself as a diamond dealer. But he had no diamonds. What he had was cubic zirconias. And you know, he was selling those as diamonds. And he had them all wrapped up and everything. So he was a bit, you Sounds know. Sounds like, like a con artist hustler. Yeah, but, yeah exactly. You know, he had a, a record and everything. So what happened was there was a Lutrec Le, painting that the, the aunt in Florida had given to Marsha. And part of her, you know, part of not her will, but as a gift. And he was he was annoyed about that. The mother who lived in the apartment had Alzheimer's, and uh, we found her in a bedroom. She was tied to a chair. The mother was tied to a chair. Tied to a chair. She was yeah. tied there for. A, a well, she was there a couple of days. I mean, she urinated all over herself and, and defecated, and you know, and uh, she was completely out of it. And uh, she was she was all she would say to us is, is she couldn't communicate. But the only thing she was kept saying was Buddy was in the backyard. That's all she said. And um, so anyway. We, we get hold of uh, David, the, the the perp in this thing, and uh, as it turns out, you know, after speaking to him for a while and and you know getting other evidence together, and then, and then actually what he did was he he Cloroxed the walls and took everything down, but he didn't get it all. We had some blood splatters on the wall um, um, that were uh, indicative of a blunt force trauma, and um, then then we found a a, a lug wrench. That he hit her with, um, you know. So the whole thing kind of came together then, you know. Almost like an yeah. It all bias. started to fall once you, once you once you make the ID uh, identify. And this doesn't happen in every case, okay. But but what happens is that sometimes it, all cases have a have a life of their own. And some cases, in this one in particular, uh, when we started to put it together, you know, we got to the apartment. He let us in, and we heard the mother in the room, and the mother's tied to a chair. And what the hell's going on, you know? And we moved it, you know, it moved one, two, three from then then on, you know. And so. he, you get him, you take him into custody. Yeah, I sure, assume, sure, quickly, yeah. Because yeah. he's, he's, it's like, okay, the superintendent had even told you that the superintendent helped him move a box. Yeah, we didn't know that prior. That, that came, like, I, I believe the superintendent's information came while we made the arrest in the same time period or just after it. You know, we finally located. Superintendent had two jobs. He, he was a superintendent of that building, a superintendent of another building. So, you know, finding all these people takes time too. No, nothing happens quickly in, a, in, a, in an investigation. And you get you get uh, David Brushingham yeah. down to the to the station, yeah. the precinct, or whatever. Two O, yeah, two O precinct. And yeah. does he is he reluctant? Does he give it up? Does he ask for an no. attorney? I mean, how, how does that how does that sort of interrogation? No, he, he doesn't. He he uh, he doesn't give it up. He just keeps talking about how the family hates him and nobody likes him, and and uh, you know he came north from Florida to be with his sister and and his mother, and um, he, he talked all about himself. You know, the whole thing was centered in on him. No, no you know? remorse for his sister dying or his no, mother not, being tied No, up. no, no, like no. Like how could that have happened? No, no, none at all. And uh, so finally, you know. Um, he's given Miranda, he continues to talk, and then finally, you know, he, he says, oh, I think I need an attorney. So fine, uh, we get, you know, we stop questioning him about it. And the next, the next day, I go get a couple of hours sleep, and we're going through this. I mean, it's, everything's happening now rapidly. And I come down, like after two hours upstairs in the, in the bunk, I come downstairs, and he says, no, I want to talk to you. You know, and he, I remember he was sipping, he had a can of Coke, and, um, and a colostomy bag, by the way, and, uh, uh, and he didn't seem the type that would be, you know, that physical of a person, but obviously he was. Uh, he said, I want to talk to you. So I said, well, I can't, I can't talk to you. You have Miranda, you know. I said, I'll tell you what I can do. I can listen to you if you want to, you know, I'm not going to ask you any questions, you know. <clears throat> and then he, he kind of gave it up and, you know, she deserved it and they, she was cutting him out, you know, and the, the aunt that lived in Florida was going to leave everything in a will to her and not for him and, you know. Just a, just as simple as that. Just yeah, that's it. Yeah, people, human beings will always surprise you. You know, it's not like it's not like fighting 
or, or looking at something else. You know, human beings will, will always do things that, that are not scripted. You know, you can go into a fire and, and be in a fire. A fire will follow, you know, certain rules of physics. You give it air, it needs air, it needs heat, and it needs, you know, uh, material, it needs, it needs um, you know, the fire triangle. And if it doesn't have any of those things, it's going to go out, okay? Or it's going to jump someplace you, if, for air. So if you open a door, it's going to go that way. But people will always surprise you. They'll never, never, never do the things that you think they're going to do. You know? He was almost 60 years old at the time, too. Yeah, that yeah he's, he was. He's, he's 60, 64, yeah. 65. So he was an older fellow. Yeah, and she yeah. was 17 years younger, and he'd been yeah. living with her mother. Yeah, and, and he, told, he told the judge, it was, the judge was uh, Leslie Crocker Snyder, and so he, he got convicted and um, testified during the case and everything. And um, so she, I think she said, you know, I wasn't there for, the, for this particular, uh, for the sentencing. She said, do you have anything to say before you were sentenced? He said, you know, if they just, if they just gave me the painting, the, the Lautrec, or if, if they would just give me my part of what, this, of what I should have gotten in, in, the, in the will, none of this would have happened. I mean, and from what I was told, that, that, that Judge Snyder just went like, you know, ballistic, you know? Yeah. Last thing I wanted to ask you about this, a Daily News article about David Brushingham just sort of given the brutal nature of this crime and, and almost just the, the disturbing coolness of being able to kill someone, tie up your mother, create this box. No. But they described him almost as a grim reaper who had had more than one person in yeah. his past yeah. who had died, starting from a, a, a younger, a, a, a young son to a daughter, a daughter yeah. who had died, also named Marcia, right. to uh -huh. a stepson, right. to another son who was shot and killed because he said he thought he was a burglar. Yeah. Death had followed this guy wherever yeah. he went. Yeah, he was, yeah. He, um, the buddies in the backyard, the, the mother was saying, was uh, a stepson that was a, um, had a bit of a dr uh, drug problem. And um, the family believed that he killed the you know, buddy and, and placed him in the backyard of a home, the home they had in, in Florida. The new people who were living in the home refused to have the police come in and dig it up. They wouldn't do it. And we didn't have enough evidence, or the Florida officials didn't have enough evidence to get a warrant to come and do it anyway. So we never found out about Buddy. A daughter was swimming with, with David in, in, um, in Florida in the, the ocean, and she drowned. And, and it wasn't kind of a, you know, no riptide or anything along those lines, you know. And, and the other, the, the boy who we killed was, he pled self-defense, and uh, so he never got charged with that one. So yeah, death followed this guy like uh, his best friend. Not know? to be too overdramatic, but you look someone like that in the eye, people might say, you didn't see anything back there. You saw that in his eyes, that cold-heartedness. Yeah, yeah. You've looked in, a lot of the, uh, looked in a lot of eyes of suspects or killers. Anything that, that stood out for, he, for you when you remember talking to him? Just With him? To, yeah, just yeah, to, he was, yeah, he was vacant. You know, it was all about him. The whole world was about him. It was all about what he deserved. It was all about how his life mattered and nobody else's life seemed to matter. Uh, he, he, was, he was a sociopath, you know, no, no doubt about it. Um, you know, it was all about him, and he's the only one that, that, that he cared about in this world. Never mentioned the sister, never mentioned the fact that, you know, blunt force trauma, fractured skull in four or five different places. Nothing. Never cared about the mother tied to the chair, you know, never cared about the kid he killed, shot for self-defense. You know, he basically thought the kid deserved to die, you know, the kid was attacking him or something he said, I'm not sure. I don't remember his whole statement when it comes to that. But I mean, the guy, the guy was, um, you know, when you deal with some of these people, so every now and then you come across a psychopath or a sociopath, they're both basically the same thing, you know, that um, nothing matters in the world but them. It's, it's all how the world is placed there for their benefit, not that they're placed into the world to, for any other thing other than to receive the benefits of why they're there. So, you know, it, and they all basically have the same, the same cover. You know, they're all, they're all made out of the same outside cover of, of, of being a psychopath, you know. According to that Daily News article I referenced about the case that inheritance David Brushingham murdered and tortured his family members to get would have made him a millionaire. 
He was sentenced to 39 years to life in prison. He died in 2002 at the age of 76 in Attica State Prison. The Tape Room is part of the Fox 5 Podcast Network. I'm your host, Dan Bowens. This episode was recorded, edited, and mixed by Matt Onimus. Our executive producers are myself, Matt Onimus, and Ahmad Asgar. Byron Harmon is vice president of Fox 5 News, and Lou Leone is vice president and general manager. Stay tuned for the next episode of The Tape Room.